Thank you so much for inviting me to come here and, and talk to you all about uh, OBIS and the incorporation of DNA uh, data. I want to uh, specifically highlight uh, Steve Fermel on here. He's been my uh, colleague working through this. He's, he's actually been the main lead. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it, but since I was down the street, I figured I would pop in and talk a little bit about how uh, OBIS is incorporating eDNA data uh, into their system. So um, if you get anything from my talk today, it's that there's a lot of help out there for working with OBIS, working with GBIF, standardizing data to the Darwin Core Standard, and then planning your data management. So before you even go out and put anything in the water, I highly recommend taking a look at a lot of these resources, um, including the NOAA Omics Data Management Guide produced by the folks over at AML. Uh, it's really helpful with identifying what you need to do, what kind of metadata standards, what repositories you need to work with, what uh, different uh, groups you need to talk to. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of good resources out there. So we, I wanted to bring this up to say that you're not alone when you're coming into the data management frame. You're, you're not alone with working through this. There's a lot of good community support. We have a standardizing marine biological data working group that actually gets together monthly to talk about how do we standardize data and how do we share it on, uh, on these different platforms. So um, I, do I will provide a link to these slides, so all of these resources, these are all hyperlinks, all information that you can go out and, and use at your disposal. So I know Tobias gave a talk yesterday about GBIF. We had a really good promotional talk from Zach talking about OBIS and, and, and standardizing and sharing your data. And so I wanted to demystify a little bit of OBIS and GBIF. What's the difference between the two? Or do they link to each other? What's going on? And so I wanted to back up and say about OBIS is, or about GBIF is that covers all biodiversity data. Now that's terrestrial and oceanic. And OBIS is primarily focused on ocean biodiversity data. However, they're, they're fundamentally based on the same data standards. And so there's simple tools to publish between both of them simultaneously. So to you, the, the data providers, it's kind of ambiguous. It, it doesn't, you don't have to go through another effort to publish to one versus the other one. So they're, they're both built on the same metadata model or the same data and metadata uh, standards. And actually yesterday, there was recently an OBIS and GBIF endorsed this joint strategy and action plan for marine biodiversity data. And that's where they're starting. They want to uh, make the pipelines between each other stronger and ensure that we have more clarity into what's going where and, and how things are working. So, um, so this is an active uh, uh, activity. So what about OBIS? OBIS is the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. It's an international initiative that aims to provide open access to biodiversity occurrence data. And it's most well known as a publishing platform and their role is data aggregator. So no matter how the observations are made, they're bringing them together into these occurrences which then can be used for, for, for uh, future studies. And it represents this investment from the international community and this vibrant scientific community of nodes, publishers, and users of standards and practices. So within the uh, Ocean Biodiversity Information System, there's a, about 127 million occurrence records across almost 5,000 data sets and 150,000 taxa. And that's across 35 different nodes. There's regional nodes and the, as well as thematic nodes. So some of the animal telemetry data is through thematic nodes. And then we have the OBIS USA node, which is what Steve Fermel manages, and I, I support him in that capacity. And so what is OBIS USA? OBIS USA is the US node to OBIS, and it's managed through USGS by uh, Steve Fermel, as I mentioned before, but I also support him in coming and talking to you all about standardizing sharing data, um, as well as mobilizing data for um, some of our IUS related activities. This represents the US interest in the international initiatives, and it also advises the US scientific community on biodiversity informatics, data, and standards, kind of what I'm doing today. And then uh, we also assist with actually mobilizing and synthesizing the data. So we'll work with you to actually get your data aligned and shared into uh, OBIS and, and onto GBIF. Um, and one of the, the big carrots for US funded entities is OBIS meets the PAR requirements. So PAR is the public access to research results. So if you get federally funded, you're required to share your data. OBIS meets those requirements. And it also provides a mechanism to archive your data for the long term at NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information. So that makes sure that your data is available and publicly accessible for 75 years, which is a, a huge carrot for everybody. And what, I, what I'm showing on the right-hand side is the, uh, the node landing page for OBIS USA. And so you can see there's co geographic coverage across the entire uh, globe. 
So what about this, Dar this data standard that, that OBIS and GBIF are built on? So OBIS uses this Darwin Core standard, is what, what it's called. It's just a CSV file. It's, it's really not that scary. I, I know if we talk about these data models and how complex they are. It's a table. You can look at it in Excel. and you can, It's a standardized vocabulary that says, if you have latitude and longitude, put it in this column and call this header, call the column this specific thing. That's all it is. It, it's not a, a really complex thing where we're doing all of these crazy net CDF and a, a higher uh, analysis products. Um, it's really just bringing it into a standardized uh, data file and uh, using a common vocabulary for describing that data. And it follows this idea of a, it's called a star schema, and essentially it says there's this core occurrence, and then there's all of these other potential measurements that could have um, gone into that core occurrence, like environmental observations, or in this case, it could be the eDNA, the methods that went into that eDNA observation. And so what I'm showing on the right-hand side is actually what a, a basic occurrence is. You have an identifier, a specific date, uh, and a, a latitude and longitude, and then maybe some depth information about where that was collected. And I want to highlight that I put a GitHub link on the bottom of it, and I know GitHub might be a little bit scary, but this is to encourage everybody that these standards are built by the community. And so if you have problems with the standards or they're not meeting your uses, there are places to go out and have those conversations to say this is where it needs to be expanded on. These aren't always, they're, they're not necessarily set in stone. They can be, um, can be advanced further. And so on the line of the extensions where you can start adding in additional metadata, additional information about the, the specific uh, occurrences, we have this specific eDNA extension. Where we're starting to include information about the sample size, sample size unit, the DNA sequence reads, associated sequences, um, and the scientific name. And then in, in some specific cases where you might not know the specific taxonomy, you can still share that data. You can use a specific scientific name, the biota incertesitis, to say we don't quite know what it is, but we still want to share this data. And maybe later on that those uh, process, those, uh, the, the raw observations can be reprocessed where we actually have information about that specific species. So this gives you a mechanism to share the data with not knowing exactly what it might be. <coughs> And I want to highlight just another example, diving a little bit deeper into this eDNA extension, and where um, we have uh, actually the DNA sequence is, is associated with that. So now we're getting that DNA sequence. It's being associated with the occurrence, and then it's also being archived at NCEI for long-term um, reuse and, and preservation. And so we're including information about the primer that was used. We're including sequence methods and the OTU information as well. So we're really expanding that data model. And this was because they, they saw a need that we needed to include this within the, the, the Darwin Core uh, standard. And so the community came together and, and identified some mechanisms. So these standards, while they're standards, they can evolve and they can change with time. And, we, and you all have a say in, in how they can be um, evolved. So uh, there are a couple tools. I know it, it, it might seem scary seeing all the, the tables and everything, but there are tools to help you out. I know Tobias mentioned earlier the eDNA converter. That, that is a test tool that's out and available for you all to play with, as well as the, I mentioned earlier, the NOAA omics uh, data management guide. And within that data management guide are actually templates to help you. There are Excel spreadsheets that you can upload data Get, get your information into there, and then there's actually been working on processes to convert that into a Darwin Core uh, file. So it makes the whole process a little bit easier, so it's not such a manual uh, activity. And so what I really want to highlight at the end of this is taking these data and distilling them down into the occurrences allows us to uh, expand beyond just the observing method and, and be able to get into that integration of data um, outside of how the, how the observations were made. And so what I have on the upper left is this, um, through the US MBON, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, we have a series of projects that collect biodiversity uh, information using all a variety of methods, including diver surveys, field fisheries independent monitoring, meta barcoding, photo plot, you name it, they're, they're using those types of observations. And so how do we kind of distill that down into what, what is this unique product? And so we've worked with OBIS to establish this dashboard of the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network data that's been mobilized to OBIS to be able to start getting at a heat map of occurrences that this, these specific projects have contributed to. 
And so that's what we're showing on the bottom left. But most importantly, on the upper right is we're getting into, we can start getting statistics on how much are people using these data once they've been shared. So we can get information about how much of these US MBON data are being uh, downloaded through OBIS as well as through GBIF with, through um, Tobias's group. And so we can see that they're not just going out there and sitting there and not being used. There, there's over, a, a, you know, almost 1.2 million downloads of these data. That's huge. That tells me that people are using these data. And then through GBIF, they have the capacity to actually mint data set DOIs, digital object identifiers, which allow you to actually track what citations are you, what literature are using these data. And so we can distill that down into how many, how many papers are citing these data, how much are these data actually being reused used, and then we can filter that down into the different categories of data. So this is well beyond what some of these uh, projects might have intended these data to be used. Now, they're, now we're getting uh, contributions into agriculture, into conservation, data management, ecology, well beyond what was expected. So by sharing these data, by distilling these down into occurrences, we can go beyond what the initial intent and these data live on and, and continue to propagate into the future. And with that, uh, there's a QR code to the slides. Like I said, there's a lot of resources in there. So I, put a, I stuck it in Zenodo and put a DOI on it, as a good data manager does. And um, those are our contact information if you have any questions. And with that, uh, thank you.